Happy with the new office now? I like the new office. No, the new office is great. Yeah. I mean, it's really nice. Um, it's good to not spend your entire working life in the same office, which in right. and of itself is a reason to switch. Yeah. And only switching up four floors is kind of a zero commute change, but lots of environment change. It's a win-win. It looks so nice. Yeah, it's, I it think nice. it's totally. been really fun. So we here to talk about like investment thesis. I yeah. think it's something I've heard a lot. Didn't really quite understood what yeah. it meant until I actually worked a little bit inside of a VC firm. Yeah. And it seems like you know every VC shop has one, right? It's just this, uh, this what guides their philosophy yep. in investing, and it seems a lot of different parameters about that. What I love about scale is that we seem to have a very well defined one, as, as far as I can tell, compared to to uh, other VCs I've worked with, and it seems to be very well defined along like three or four different axes that uh, that I can detect. But maybe I'm wrong about that. A lot of it is just you know what I'm observing. Out. So the first thing that we seem to be very disciplined about is kind of the, the stage we invest in, right? And from an entrepreneur standpoint, I might see that as like, you know, some people do seed, some people do growth, some people do late stage, and, and scale as a, as a very kind of clear kind of sense sure. of the window they should invest in. Sure, and, and, and yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I think you are right about every firm. Any good investment firm, in my view, will invariably have an internal language that they use to communicate to each other about possible investments with some degree of precision. Right. Obviously, if you're running bonds, it's a totally different language, but you have to have that. It's an indication that you've thought about the thing enough to have a fairly precise and fine-grained sense of what you're looking for. Right. So yeah, so that's true of any investment shop. But you, you do see some firms that kind of have a very wide investment thesis, right? They, they do a lot of different bets and a lot of different but things. That is the, but, then, exactly, but the language of the investment thesis will encompass that. We are deliberately and consciously deciding to not put a lot of barriers on ourselves. We just do this. That could be the statement, right? We believe, and it, it comes from a, you know, either it's random or it comes from a belief statement. We believe that we get the best results when we don't encumber people with process or discipline. And we do, so, so whatever it is, it has to have a shared philosophy. Right. Because what's really hard in any partnership is if you don't have a shared philosophy and different people are doing different things, if one person is making, trying to hit singles and doubles and the other person is hitting home runs, then one or the other of those two people will be pissed off with the other. Right. Because if the home run guy hits, he'll be like, I'm making all the money here. And if he misses, the singles and doubles guy said, I'm carrying this guy again, right? right? Yeah. So it doesn't work. So you have to have a common language. Right. And for scale, you're exactly right. Where we invest in, you know, kind of if you think of the continuum from early to late, we invest precisely in the middle. Because what we're looking for is early product market fit. So we're no longer taking product risk, but we like to take a lot of business risk. We like to take execution and scaling risk. So the typical scale deal is doing one or two million dollars in trailing revenue. It's acquired some early customers, typically the CEO is the salesperson, you know, maybe one or two reps, and you know, you've gotten that early customer traction, but you're a long way from a predictable, repeatable, scalable model, and you know, that's what we underwrite getting right. to. So it's not even about like, the size of the check you write or the position you take. Sometimes I've heard that be a factor. It's really just about the risk profile. Totally. Company. I mean, I think, look, to some extent, you don't want to do a you know, two million dollar runway deal for two percent ownership because you're going to put in a lot of work if you're committed to your companies and you're not going to get paid for it. So we do want to get meaningful ownership targets, but we start first and foremost with a stage because I always say stage is a proxy word for risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. Is that? And you know, what kind of risk do you underwrite? Is another way of saying what are you competent in understanding? Well, early stage investors are fundamentally underwriting product risk and, frankly, to some extent, team risk. Mid-stage investors are underwriting go-to-market execution risk, sales and marketing execution. And late-stage investors are usually actually underwriting valuation risk, right. <laughs> whether they know it or not. Right? The company works. It's clearly worth a lot of money. Is it worth more or less than you pay for it? And if you look at the failure modes of each of those three stages, it goes to failure to underwrite, understand that risk correctly. Right. So we're all about understanding business risk, about go-to-market execution risk, because right. that's where the dollars go. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? And so the, I think that also guides kind of other things that, that I think make up the investment thesis, such as how you evaluate companies that, that apply. And we talked about this a little bit with Dale and Susan in sure. other videos. But so, you know, uh, how does that work for you, right? How do you think that, that your investment thesis guides you to, like, evaluate companies one way or another? Sure. I mean, I think we always say, you know, we're looking for two things, and it's, you know, big picture trends and near end traction. The big picture trends is a way of saying we have to believe this can become a big company. There's simply no point in investing in a $2 million company that can grow 50% year on year. It will never matter, right? You're investing in companies that are going to become $100 million plus in revenue base case, right? So you got to have the big trends that are going to push it from 2 to 100. That's 50x growth, right? So that's the first thing you have to have, which is big picture 
um, long-term trends pushing in your favor. But then the second one is almost the opposite of that, near traction. What we're saying is, you know, if you're an early stage investor, you're looking for the big picture trends that are going to happen in the future. But right? we're looking for the big picture trends that are happening right now. And the way you see that is actual traction. Right. Right? You see customers buying, you see um, customers getting excited, you see renewals, you see some evidence that the market is saying now is the time when you can get it. Mm-hmm. Right? So big picture trends and then near traction. Right. And you know, Sorry, no, no. It seems like you also look a lot at like, that ability to execute, right? Yes. So you're, you're well, I was going to say exactly that, which is because someone, someone always says you know, the way off is between management and market, right? And the reality is, practically speaking, near in execution, near in traction is a proxy for management. How well are they executing? You know, if the market is here, if the time is now, how well are they executing? It's not a perfect guide, mm-hmm. right? Because um, you know, frequently we're backing first time entrepreneurs. I mean, at various stages, in our, my career as an investor, I've you know, had at various times some of the youngest publicly held CEOs or CEO CFO teams on the NASDAQ or the NYSE. So we're backing people in their first job. So it's not always enough to say, I'm going to check the management experience. So how do you calibrate a first time CEO? Frank, yes, you can try and calibrate the intangibles. Do I like him? Is that, do I think he's a winner? But you know what I've learned? Is that companies that execute well in the near term, on average, continue to execute and companies that let you down in the near term let you down forever, right? right? So I really calibrate off these teams' execution. Mm-hmm. So I have that near end traction, the ability, do they do what they say they'll do? Mm-hmm. Do they get the growth they say they will? Do they understand their business? Right. That to me is the best proxy. It's the only proxy you have of whether a $2 million guy, uh, revenue company can go all the way. Right, that makes sense. And so I guess that also says a little bit about the, the next part of the instant thesis, which is how do you actually manage the investment once you've made it, right? And it seems like some VCs try to you know, be relatively hands off, although that's rare these yeah. days, right? And, and people have different ways in which they like to partner and add value, right, sure. so to speak, with their investment once they've made the, the play. And so how do, how do you think about that for scale, for example? Sure, uh, you know, and I've blogged about this. I have a very I won't say rigid, but I have a very clear idea of what I'm going to do and what I'm going to help with and what I'm actually going to do, right? And what I said, you know, what is the job of the venture board member? And it's an odd job. I always tell the CEO, because CEOs will ask you this, what's your value add other than money, right? And it depends on how cynical I'm feeling that day. (laughs) First of all, I often start with, well, the money actually has a lot of value, too. Let's not start with that. And that's just me being difficult. But what I really then say is this. You know, I asked them, what are you looking for in a venture board member and what should you be looking for, right? Because what I say to them is, I have really four jobs as a venture board member. And you know, the definition of a job is if you don't do it, it doesn't get done, right? It's not an assist. Helping with introductions is something I want to do, but it's not my job, right? The four things are, I always tell my CEOs, first, I'm going to be able to have a partial vote as a board member in hiring and firing and compensating you, right? So the first question is, do we, you know, hiring and firing your board member? your CEO, right? That's a big decision. That's how I, uh, you should understand, Mr. CEO, how I approach that, when I, wa- when I want to back you, when I want to replace you, how I would handle that situation. That's the big job. The second big job that a board member does is finance the company. And obviously, when you're doing the new deal, you're financing the company, right? The real question for you as a CEO is, will this investor be there when times are hard? Will he write a check when not everyone is willing to write a check? Does he have the gumption to support the company in t- times are tough? That's the second thing you've got to calibrate with an venture investor. The third thing, and it's very obvious, is agreement on the broad strategic direction. And I always say broad strategic direction. What you don't want is someone who wants to get in the weeds of your go-to-market execution, un, you know, unless they're some kind of functional expert. But the typical VC, after five years in the venture business, is a functional expert in nothing. Right? Because everything they, lo- they knew is now ten, five or ten years old. So, I have to agree the broad strategic direction. You know, if I want, you know, if the CEO is building a B2B play and I want it to be a consumer company, those would be the kind of things you need to hash out. If the CEO thinks it, it, this product applies best to the enterprise and I want to do an SMB play, those are the kind, and you know, if the CEO thinks now is the time to execute aggressively and I think now is the time to be circumspect, those are the kind of strategic alignments you have to hash out in advance. And then the last thing you have to do as a board member is elect when to sell the company and when not to sell the company. And both of those in different ways can be a hard decision. So if you step back, those are four big jobs, all of which the board member has to do under US corporate law, none of which the board member can effectively delegate to anyone else. Right? And what I always say to my CEOs is this, I can give you a whole bunch of value add stick on top of that. But if you hire two or three venture board members who do that job well, you're halfway home. 
And if you hire some, if you take on board some investors who don't do that job well, then no matter how many good introductions they made, you could well be screwed. Because right. they might terminate you for silly reasons. To take the other extreme, they might not say to you, we need a better CEO, and that might reduce the value of your investment. And both have happened. Right. You know, I'm sure the first CEO of eBay is pretty happy that you know, they hired Meg Whitman, he made five or $10 billion. It's not a bad outcome, right? Equally, I'm equally sure that you know, the guys at Google are really happy they took, and the guys at Amazon, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, took it all the way. Right. It's never an obvious decision, right. which is why being very careful about the people that you are allowing have a vote in making that decision is so important. Right, that makes complete sense. So and then the, the last thing, and, and maybe to finish kind of quickly, is this idea of, uh, of where you do your investments. And I think you know, maybe scale is a bit more narrow in yeah. this and than the average company, but there's, I've heard like a really well thought of reasoning for that. And so maybe we can talk about sure. that. Well, I think well. we focus on, you know, primarily on enterprise software. By enterprise, I, I hate the word because it tends to imply it's big company. We focus on B2B software. Software being sold to businesses to either help them grow revenue or to help them cut expenses. Right, or to be more efficient or to deliver customer delight. Sometimes tr because of that we get the look through to the end consumer because what you're seeing more and more is many of the success of the software company selling to these B2B businesses is in large part a function of how successful they are in selling to their consumers. I mean, you see that Demandware, which is not a scale company, but we looked at it foolishly and didn't do it. Um, they get paid on a percentage of GMV. So their customers are the retailers, but you're effectively betting on their success to, to kind of touch that consumer trend. But we fundamentally invest in businesses, you know, software companies right. and technology companies that are selling to businesses right. to you know, help them exceed. And why do you do that? You've got to pick something you're good at. Right. Right? It's just that simple. Right? I mean, I think that you know, the ability to do all things you know, is, is given to very few of us. Right? I think you know, there are about two thirds of the number of wins above a billion dollars or above a hundred million dollars in the entire venture technology stack come from enterprise software, mm -hmm. right? As I'm sure you realize, you know, the one third that come from consumer tend to on average, be, there are less of them, but they tend to be larger because consumer tends to be a winner takes all, while enterprise software tends to be more of an oligopoly. There's right. two or three winners. So there's, you know, over the last 10 years, roughly 130 exits above a billion dollars. And roughly two thirds of them are enterprise software, and roughly one third of them are consumer, with you know sub ten percent being everything else in the noise, mm -hmm. right? So we think there's a lot of opportunity there. We can be successful there. It's what we know. It's what we're good at. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome.